Hi, everyone, and thank you, Annie, for the introduction. So surveys suck. At least, that's how many people feel. And the technical term for that is called survey fatigue. It's when we receive so many requests and prompts begging for our attention that we just get really tired of that. You cannot visit an app or, or visit the websites, uh, let alone buy something without getting a survey request. Just to give you a small sample of what I mean, this is what I've collected over the course of about two weeks. So, this is getting out of hand. And what I'm going to do with this talk, I'm going to take this time to give you two points of view. One point of view is something we can all relate with. It is the point of view of the user of the internet, getting, um, <clears throat> getting confronted with all of these requests. And the other point of view is of the point of view of the researcher, who, for better or worse, wants to use surveys to get survey data to improve certain decisions. And the problem of survey fatigue is bad for both of them. And I will explain what it is, what causes it, why it's bad, and how we can fix it. For those who might be thinking, this is going to be a jolly talk, it will not be. That is not my style. When I see problems, I point them out. And this is a big problem. But I also believe that understanding problems and defining them clearly, that is the way to improve. And I, in keeping with that theme, for every problem I will raise today, and it will be quite a lot, I will also give solutions a way forward. And I might also plead that if you or your team are considering to do another survey, you probably shouldn't. Because we over-survey when other methods might have been better. When we do survey, we ask too many questions. And the questions we do ask are often confusing, and we design surveys in rather unusable and inaccessible ways. And that needs to change. And it's up to us to make that change. So let's get our journey started. And it starts by clearly defining what we're dealing with. And there are two main aspects to survey fatigue. And I will start with, <laughs> with the first one. So as you have seen in the introduction, I'm actually quite confident that most of you can relate. If, giving you, if I would give you two or three weeks or even one, you would probably be able to make up an equally formidable collection or collage of surveys. And that is a problem. We can all agree that there are too many surveys. Every time you buy something, visit an app, use a website, or even use customer service. You know when you reply to a customer service mail and for every reply you send, you get another survey in your mailbox? This is too much. And in fact, there are so many surveys that even Fred Reichelt, the dude who invented MPS, he is now against surveys. <laughs> so it seems that the tables has turned. And this raises the question, what's going on here? Why is this problem so pervasive? that even people like Fred Reichelt are now against it. So to get to the basics of the problem, survey fatigue is when people have been asked for their opinion so many times, they are overwhelmed by the sheer number of attention grabs, of companies begging for their effort and attention, that they just cop out. They get tired, they do not respond. The result is that they don't even start the survey, and the response rate goes down. And boy, has it gone down. It has been dropping like stones for the past decades. Now, you might look at that graph on the right and think, hey, that looks nice. It goes up, but it's a reverse scale. So there's no good news, news to be found on this slide. And when I make this plea in front of an audience, sometimes the first reaction I get from researchers as well is, well, why is this a problem? Because surveys are quantitative research. We set a target for our sample size. If fewer people respond and you have a company with a lot of clients, just ask more people. And yeah, that is the reasoning that most companies make. And that is exactly why this problem is as big as it is, as big as it is today. Because when survey response rates go down and your reaction is to just survey more people, imagine what happens to the survey fatigue. And then there are other problems out of this as well. So when you look at the internet today and the way companies deal with you, as a brand, you can really risk hurting your own brand perception, coming across as always asking, nagging, please fill in my form, please answer this survey, your opinion means a lot to us. This isn't good. This is not a good experience for anyone. And the result for people is we overcorrect our noise filter. But our filter is not a perfectly tuned instrument. We tend to, as I mentioned, overcorrect. So this means that 
heaven forbid, your company might have an actually relevant message for its customers, it now gets diluted in this oversaturation of all the other notifications, surveys included. So your important message maybe doesn't even get across in, in this attention economy where everyone is asking for the same thing. But the people who are expected to give the attention don't really see any reason why they would. Because the internet today sucks. It's not just surveys. You cannot visit a website without some kind of cookie consent, usually using a dark pattern so that the most clickable button is the accept all function. Getting a notification pop-up from your browser. Some manipulative newsletter sign up two seconds into the website visits. This nagging chatbot at the right, hiding the right side of your screen. And then when you want to escape the website, it tracks your cursor and it asks you in a survey, why do you want to leave the website? Did you not find what you're looking for? Nevertheless, would you recommend my product or service to friends or colleagues on a scale from zero to 10? <laughs> <laughs> so this is problem number one. We have too many survey requests, and they, those survey requests are a large part of the noise that we are bombarded with and that tank the online user experience. This is why survey fatigue sucks for everyone. But now I'm going to deep dive into why it sucks for researchers the most. So it's because something will happen with your survey data when the response rate is low. Specifically for surveys, it's about this difference between the people who responded and the people who did not. Imagine if you have a survey and you have, let's say, 10,000 of responses. That seems like a massive number. Very small margins of error, very low sampling error. Statistically, all seems very robust. But if you send that survey, like many companies do, to your entire customer base, let's say you have a million customers, that means you have a non-response rate of 99%. And then the question you should ask yourself, is that 1% of people that did end up responding, might they be somehow meaningfully different from the 99% that didn't? Perhaps different in a way that would impact the design or business decision that you, are, that you want to make based on that data. And chances, is, chances are that they are different, that there is an important difference. We cannot believe that if only 1% of people respond, that we can take their opinions and generalize that to the other 99. They don't speak for them. Very often, these are people with more extreme views, either on the positive or the negative side. And this is illustrated nicely in this graph that shows the zone of response on both sides of the spectrum, both positive and negative, and then this large majority in the middle whose answers just are not given. And sometimes companies could legitimately be interested in the extreme responders, in having those sharp opinions. But then what they shouldn't do is take the extreme responses on the left and the right and then average them out and write in their study report, on average, everyone is neutral. And very often you see this happening. They average everything, and this is dangerous. And in fact, this, taking the stance that you're more interested in the extreme views is not a great stance because the majority in the middle, the word majority is important. This might be the largest part of your customer base opinions and views on things because you want to sell to them as well. Imagine if you're like a startup. In Belgium, many people still have money on their savings accounts and they lose money every year. If you are like a startup, an investing startup, and you want to get them to invest, do you really believe that those passive non-investors are the ones that are going to answer your survey? Nevertheless, they are your target group. You should get their responses. Just like in UX strategy and product management, it's all about targeting the right people. If those are the people you cannot get to answer, you might have a problem. And this is what it amounts to. In this beautiful graph by Visualize Value, it shows in such a nice way what bias really is. And, and the thing that's dangerous here, that little dot on the bottom, it says perception. The problem is when you send a survey, that perception seems like the truth. You don't know what you don't know. You don't know that you're only getting extreme responses. But chances are, if your response rate is really low, you are. And this problem doesn't show up in the statistics. You cannot calculate your way out of this. You're just getting biased results. And it, as if this problem wasn't bad enough, it gets worse. Because as I mentioned before, what do companies do when faced with low response rates? They ask more people. So the survey fatigue goes up, and the response rate goes down even further. 
So it, it's like a vicious cycle. Luckily, the opposite can be true as well. If we can somehow get the response rate up, get the survey fatigue down, then companies will send less survey requests because they will hit their sample size numbers quicker. And how do we do that? Well, there are a couple of methods we can employ, and I will highlight two of them for you tonight. First one, objectives before methods. What do I mean with this? I mean that you have to think really hard about what is the real burning issue for your company and for your clients? What really matters? What's keeping you up at night? Often you see companies doing research for the petty stuff, the question no one is afraid to ask, instead of the burning issues, the things that could really tank a business model if you are basing yourself on, on assumptions. So focus on what's important. Don't just do research for research's sake either. This is another thing I sometimes come across. You see the same thing with Agile, right? Where people do the activity just so they can say that they are doing the activity. It's almost like a cargo cult or a theater. It shouldn't be. The reason to do research is to learn and to take better decisions. This is a simplified version of a template I use with clients. So the first question is, is normally an easy one. It's where I ask them to just think of all of those big questions that they want to get an answer to. All of the things that could potentially de-risk their business initiatives. They can even imagine a perfect client sitting in front of them who is able to answer honestly to every question you pose at them. And then write down all of these questions and prioritize them. And this would be a good exercise in itself, but we shouldn't stop there. We should take it upstream and ask why. Why do we need to get the answers to these questions? Why are these the research objectives? So this means connecting the insight we hope to get with the actual actions and decisions that we would make in our design or in our business. And once you have this connection, that puts you up for success. It enables you to work like the sentence you see in the bottom in blue where you have a lot of important things to learn, and then you can start thinking of what might be the best method. And spoiler alert, it very often is not a survey. But the opposite is true in most companies. They, they take it all the way around. Instead of leading with what they want to learn and why, they start, they're like, ah, next month we're going to launch a survey, so we're collecting questions. Who wants to put stuff in there? But that's, of course, a recipe for disaster. And in part, this is because it's normal. It's, it's an immature way of dealing with research, which we need to forgive every company because we are still growing, especially here in Europe. But the other part of the problem is more pervasive. It's because of this numbers bias. We ascribe so much value and truth to numbers. But the, the real truth is that you can prove anything with statistics. They're highly prone to being abused. And yet you see clients and companies for that same reason, they just uh, stick to that. They want to, they want to have the numbers. It feels so true. It gives them these, the, these fancy things they can put in their dashboards, like an inside snack or inside crack, whatever floats your boat. But it's fast, it's easy, but it's not necessarily the truth. And this blind faith in numbers, it can be dangerous and misleading. And if you don't believe me, maybe you want to go to these traumas again, where surveys, and in fact, highly statistically sound surveys were used to completely miss the ball on these predictions. And maybe we just need to start realizing that the predictive validity of surveys, because of all of their biases and errors that don't even show up in the statistics, maybe the predictive validity is rather poor. Things like non-coverage error and non-response error, which we've, see, which we've seen, you, will, you don't know that you have this problem. It doesn't show up in the statistics and it can completely bias your results. And then there's another problem which pains me a bit more. It's that even in UX, we kind of like this fast easiness of surveys to get us those quick yolts of faux insights. Instead of staying closer to the real type of research that at least in UX it starts with. I'm a mixed methods researcher. I love quant, but also, I'm also a UXer and I realize that quant is probably not the first thing you should do in UX. And that, that is a rule. Surveys are so quick to set up that they seem very simple, but the truth is they are extremely difficult. That's why I like them. They're interesting. They, pr they provide a challenge, but they're very difficult to do right. And here's the main reason. When you're doing qualitative research, which is moderated in person, either remote or not, but it's in person, I know all of the researchers here will have 
uh, experience this. You, you are doing your first interview session, you ask the key question, and you get this stare of death, <laughs> or you get a, a response with some weird body language, or a response that seems like something sound, but is, seems like a response to a completely different question, and you realize, ah, I screwed up, this is a shitty question. This is like the prototype test of the interview. And you don't even have to wait for your second session to iterate and pivot. You can just rephrase the question in that same interview. It's like when you learn to play an instrument and you play a false note and you get instant feedback so you can instantly improve. With surveys, you have none of this. You hit send and you blast the survey to 2,000 people and then you get the responses and it could be that every one of them misinterpreted all of the questions. You will not know. There is no feedback and that is dangerous. So the question you, then get, you can then ask yourself is, so do we ever need surveys? And the answer is, yeah, sometimes they can re be really useful, especially for things that people can reliably self-report and where a large sample size is useful to deal with the inherent variability, like with attitudes and opinions. I like to use this model from the people at Measuring You who have helped me out a lot. Uh, their website is really great when you are working in quant. And they put a lot of keywords there. And if your research objectives or your questions have these keywords, this could give you a hint of where you should be looking. But I can tell you that if your first question, and it should be your first question, is to understand what do people need, how do they work, what's their context of use, what's their inner thinking, start at the qual side of things. And what you can do after doing, for example, interviews, and you have seen patterns in a lot of potentially unmet needs, is to then use a survey to quantify those unmet needs. That is exactly the goal of a survey. The whole sole goal of a survey is to generalize insights you have from somewhere, like interviews, to an entire population. To then be, have the ability to answer questions like, what could be the size of my uh, market share, potentially? How many people are experiencing these unmet needs? How high do they rank them? So surveys add a number to the user needs and user goals you gather from interviews. There are other use cases for surveys, but this is a big one. It can help quantify your qualitative insights. All of these trade-offs and, and, and questions about qual versus quant or both, all assume that the company is honestly out there to learn something about the customer. But sometimes that doesn't even seem the case. This is an example of two really big Belgian companies. Now, one thing you should know is, in, when you're surveying satisfaction, there is in fact a globally recognized, benchmarked, validated way to do that. It's got five points on a scale, and the midpoint, the third point, is neutral. So you see on the left example, instead of having two satisfied options out of five, which is how you calculate satisfaction rates, you divide the number of respondents on those two, divide by the other ones. What this company did is they replaced neutral with also satisfied. <laughs> so now three of the five options are satisfied. This is just completely skewed. And then the one on the right, it's even worse. They just cut out the neutral option. And they're probably pretty cocky about it as well. Yeah, this way we force people to say either yes or no. But that's not how people work. Neutral can be a valid sensation. So you, not only do you decrease reliability by having less points on the scale, you decrease the validity of your satisfaction survey. Because people who are honestly neutral, you're just not giving them a chance. And guess what? Those neutral people, what are they going to pick? Unsatisfied or satisfied? So this, again, inflates you. And this is not something companies do to learn. They already know the answer. They love themselves. They just want someone else to say it to them as well. This is narcissism disguised as research, marketing by selfie stick. This is completely bonkers. <laughs> and even if you're doing your, survey, your satisfaction surveys in a good way, five point scale, neutral mid option, it can still be pretty dangerous. This is a case that made the headlines, I think about 10 years ago. So you had Walmart. And they were getting heavy into satisfaction. And they s measured satisfaction, and it turned out to be pretty low. And the main reason for the low satisfaction, the aisles are too cluttered. So what they did is they decluttered the aisles. They did exactly what the customer wanted. They measured satisfaction again. Satisfaction shot up. It worked. And then they measured sales. And sales went down by $1.85 billion. So what's going on here? This example is actually pretty well described in literature. It's also been recognized by Bloomberg, Wall Street Journal, and let me see, MIT. And it speaks again to the predictive validity of surveys. It turns out that satisfaction isn't always that great of a driver or a, pre or a, or a predictor 
of actual revenue or business success. And the same can be said about NPS. Some studies even show a negative correlation. Everyone hates Ryanair, but they're selling pretty well. If they would ask what people would prefer, they would say more legroom, but then the price would go up and they wouldn't sell that much anymore. It's, it turns out not to be a good strategy for companies to just lead their business strategy based on satisfaction surveys and doing what every customer wants of them. That's exactly why UX research dives deeper. We are there to investigate not what users want or what they say they want, but their actual unmet user needs. We are interested in behavior more than we are interested in attitudes. This is another example of a, of a big company confusing behaviors and attitudes. So it might be a bit small to read, but it's a survey about the information architecture, the structure of the website, the navigation, the menu. It has these ridiculous options like, on a scale of one to 10, how do you rate the number of clicks you had to click to get to where you wanted to be? So this should not be a survey. <laughs> To, uh, to get matters straight, this should have been, if you want to test your information architecture on like a rough schematic level, use a tree test. Perfect for that. Behavioral, real insights. If you already have some kind of design, you can use a usability test. And in this case, probably a quantitative one. So you can measure things like time on task. How long did it take them to get where they want to be? Success rate. Did they successfully find what they want? Behavioral measures are needed when you're testing an, ar an information architecture not attitudes. So this is one big reason, one big way to lower survey fatigue. It's simply realizing that very often we should, shouldn't have used a survey in the first place. And then that brings us to the second way. It's how we can feedback what we are doing with insights to attract people to fill in our surveys or to do research with us in general. And it's all about how are we motivating people to participate. And there's this nice theory, the social exchange theory by Dillman. And if you don't know Dillman, he's like one of those social research survey gurus. And I think for UXers, this is quite familiar. It looks a bit like BJ Fogg's behavior model or the expected utility interaction cost versus value thing. It's people weigh different things. And the two things they mostly weigh is, what do I think this is gonna cost me in terms of effort? And what is the value I think or I hope I can get out of this? Or in this, the terminology used here, what's the perceived reward? And then of course there is trust. Because if you don't trust the company to act on that reward, to give you, for example, the improvements that you are writing in the surveys, then, then the perceived reward is worthless because there is no trust. Now what's happening today, trust in institutions is going down, perceived effort is going up because people get bombarded with all of these requests, remember? And this just means that the response rate will keep on dropping unless we somehow get the perceived reward to go up as well. And very bad news when it comes to that. So according to numbers by Gartner, and this is really bad. So they, did, they have evidence to show that as a surprise to no one, 95% of companies use surveys. We know part of the problem. But here is where it becomes interesting. Only 10% of companies actually use what they learn from surveys to improve anything. And then only 5% feedback, communicate those improvements back to the customers. So let that sink in, because this is scandalous. Everyone's collective reaction to this would be, what the shit? These are for-profit companies asking people for their insights for free. They're not paying them and then doing nothing with them. I have seen cases where a survey had 16,000 responses, some of them open answers, and no one was reading them anymore. The survey just never got pulled from the app. This is not great. And we are not gonna fix this by just writing, your feedback is very valuable, or please, your answers mean a lot. Given what we know, this is not the way out. And none of these examples are perfect either, but some of them are pretty good. And you see what they're doing. They're thinking like, like UX people should think. What can we do to lower the perceived effort? Maybe we can point out that it's only three questions, that it will only take them two minutes. And what can we do to increase the perceived reward? Like making it very tangible, what we are gonna do with the responses. Mentioning that in the past, we've already used research insights to actually improve the app or the product for them. Make it very tangible what the responses will be used for can really help your case here. 
And that was section one. And then section two, which I'm going to embark right now, which is shorter than section one, is about what happens when people do muster up the courage to start um, so entering your survey, starts giving answers, but then something happens down the road. And I think we have all been through this. I have. Like, from a professional point of view, I am probably more interested in surveys than normal people. So I take them, a lot of them. And even I, I get just bogged down in the middle of them. When you have answered 20 very similar questions, and you're like, how long is this going to take? And the little progress bar thingy didn't move at all. And, and then two things can happen. And both things suck for the participant, but also for the researcher. So either they just drop out. That's option number two. And the problem here is that you only have complete responses from the people who didn't drop out. So there is a strong survivorship bias, which is kind of a synonym for the non-response error that we have seen before, the self-selection bias, where you only have this small, specific subset of your sample of different people. Even worse is when they do stay and they start embarking on this mindless response behavior. And this um, becomes apparent in things like zigzagging, where you see, really see the responses going from the left to the right in, all, in those radio buttons, or just straight lining, or, or always answering I don't know or other option or only the neutral options, like garbage responses. And if you would be a very diligent company that puts a lot of effort in analyzing the surveys, you will find this and you can remove it. Let's say there are probably a lot of companies that don't do that. So that means that your survey data is completely biased. It already was because of the sample size problem. And now it's even worse because the people who do fill it in, if they are irritated by your questions, the, survey, the, the question responses become pretty mindless. So this is a study by Kantar and Lightspeed about some of the biggest reasons people drop out. And subject matter, we have seen that today. That's about the burning issue. If you're asking people about something they don't care about, not going to end up very well. But then the two others are important, survey length and then question grids, or in general, the design of the survey. When it comes to survey length, this will surprise no one, but SurveyMonkey actually used 100,000 surveys to prove this. Every additional question will cause more people to drop out. So the lesson here is keep the surveys short. Do not ask the question if you're not going to act on the data. Remember that little template, like why do you need to know this? If you have a survey question that isn't directly tied to a potential business or design decision, why is it in the survey? Why is it even there? And this goes for everything, like gender, age. If you don't need those, those things, do not ask those things. And also, allow people to skip questions. I hate it when I see a survey and everything is marked with an asterisk. Like, it's, you're not paying me, <laughs> it's, and, and it's free for you, and now you're obligating me to respond to everything even when I maybe don't know the answer or don't care enough to fill it in, so I will just give you a mindless response and you somehow prefer that? How, like, that is not a good way. I rarely make questions obligatory. So allow people to skip, otherwise they will quit. And this is a metaphor I often use, accredited to David Travis. Research, and especially surveys, they're kind of like washing machines. If you put a lot in there, it gets out still dirty you learn very little about a lot. And the goal in, in research should be to learn a lot about a little. So don't put too much in there. This goes for surveys, but also for interviews, usability tests. And as I mentioned before, but it bears repeating, don't put the question in there. Ditch it if you're not going to act on it. One of the other reasons we saw that really amount to survey question fatigue is the quality of the survey questions and how they are designed. And the worst offender of all are grids. And every survey tool, has the, has the option, but it's not because you can that you should. And my advice to you would be don't use grids. Don't use them, just don't. People hate them. It's been proven that 15%, that, that you get 15% more dropouts just because of using grids. It's even, even been studied, regardless of the dropout, that people just actively dislike grids. They dislike the survey, they start disliking your brand because of it. It results in that mindless zigzagging or straight lining behavior. And then in terms of UX, it sucks even more. Like, can you see the interaction costs? Think of Fitz Law, all of those little tiny radio buttons far removed from the statements, small fonts, lots of eye scanning from left to right. And then imagine this on mobile, where you have like 
the worst of pretending to be responsive design, or you have horizontal scrolls on top of the vertical scrolls, we shouldn't use this. We shouldn't put this out there in the world as a company. This is another Belgian example. Like, come on, guys. <laughs> Surveys are forms. This should not be a drop down. Every, every designer worth their salt knows that if you ask for like a small number, an age, it should just be a numeric input field. It would have been way quicker and easier for me to just type my age than do this little thing here. And we need to understand form design as, as designers, and then we need to apply that to our surveys. This is from the same company, and it's even worse. I, it took me a while to understand what was going on. So we painstakingly obsess over forms as designers, it's a staple in human-computer interaction, in conversion optimization online. But then when it comes to surveys, which are a very challenging type of form, we're like, meh, not interested. And we really should look into it. So I don't know, really know what's going on here, but what I see is two error messages in different languages, not indicating the actual field that they relate to. And then to make it even worse, the field labels are below the input fields. Like where did you learn that? In reverse UX school? Who made this? Why does this, this is from two weeks ago. <laughs> so this is from a re, from head of research at Stripe, and I completely agree with his message. Surveys are part of the end-to-end -end user experience of the company you are working for. So yeah, it might be that you're not responsible of the surveys, but that's the same excuse as telling me that I cannot improve the website because the CMS or the framework, fuck that you are partly responsible for the user experience that your company is creating. And it should be okay. At least, it should be good, ideally. And then also, don't do this. So this is the Bank of America, and they're asking you, how close do you as a person feel to Bank of America? <laughs> the overlap of the circles indicates closeness. And then they add specifically, please respond as quickly as you can. Okay. That is creepy. <laughs> these surveys, these brand perception surveys are getting out of hand. Nobody should be required to love their bank. This question doesn't belong in a survey. I think this comes from a couples therapy session. <laughs> and we, we've seen those two Belgian examples um, that are basically just an ego trip in the form of a survey. This is taking all of that to a whole new level. Imagine someone selecting number seven, which is, I feel 100% close to Bank of America. We are the same. <laughs> that is messed up. <laughs> but even more messed up is Bank of America. Like, think of this through the lens that we've seen today. So what could this teach you in terms of the business decisions that you want to make? How does this relate to the burning issue, to what keeps you up at night? What decisions or actions will you make based on this? And then from a research perspective, how is this valid? What are we even measuring here? Why are we doing this if not just one big ego trip? Because someone thought of this. Someone then designed this poorly, I may add. L look at those radio buttons in between the actual options. Like Everything is wrong with this. And then someone hits sent <laughs> probably the, to their entire customer base of, I don't know, 20 million Americans. So. Next time someone proposes you a survey, one, don't do that. And then also think of, do we really need one? Because as we've seen, very often there are better, more valid methods to get to the answers that we really need. Two, are you really connecting every question that you would put in the survey with the things that you really need to learn? And then three, what can we do to increase the response rates? Are we attracting, are we feedbacking, are we communicating with our potential respondents? Are we treating them with respect? Are we actually improving based on our surveys? Are we actively working to get the response rate up and survey fatigue down? And then thirdly, do it yourself. <laughs> like any time a stakeholder, yeah, we need a survey. How many did you take last week? And in fact, use this as some kind of call to action. If you are considering surveys and some use cases are good for that, take all of the surveys you, are, you receive for at least a week. Make it into something fun get some social pressure going, compare it with each other, you will, one, build empathy with potential responders, 
And two, you will learn a ton from good examples in both the survey requests and the questions, and also from really shitty examples. And if you have those, please send them to me. I collect them. <laughs> and that was it for my talk. Thank you very much for your interest in research. And if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to take them now. Otherwise, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn, where I will also be happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thanks, Glenn. I guess I'm going to join you in this oh, little insert moment here. We'll, we'll be like Bank of America, you and me. Oh, yeah, we can like, be like the two it's circles. Be like a, a haunting image. I'm going to just feel like Bank of America is like breathing on my neck now, like <laughs> trying to make out. <laughs> yeah. Who is the bank, bank in this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so creepy. Um, thanks so much for that, like, really funny and also um, insightful talk. Are there any questions from the audience in the yeah, house? I yes. Can you hear me right over there? Yeah. yeah. Um, my question is, what is your view on big data compared to surveys? Like multinational, for example, they have the opportunity to collect big data because it's full of users. Uh, well, you and I maybe not, but what's your opinion about that? When you mention big data, do you mean more like automated data, like from analytics? Uh, for example, like pixel trackers, but also heat mapping, yeah. and like physical things. Well, one, it's better in the sense that it's behavioral. So it's something real. Mm -hmm. And what I often say to clients when they obsess over, we have to measure satisfaction. I'm like, do you really? What about, what, what if we think of how would a satisfied customer behave differently in our product, in our app? And then you measure that behavior using heat maps and analytics. That's way more valid because behavior is much closer to actual business results and user value than what you write in terms of, I feel dissatisfied today, or I had a shitty day, now I'm not satisfied. So we should turn it on its head and try to understand how would a satisfied person behave differently and then measure that. So that's how I feel about big data in general. One thing I, I do want to add, there's an awesome TED talk by Trisha Wang exactly about big data versus thick data, which is like the qualitative data. And she actually predicted that smartphones would become really important. She was working at Nokia at the time. And Nokia was one of the front runners in big data, and they said, nah, sorry, ethnographical qualitative data, that's rubbish. We're going to believe the big data. You know how that story ended. So as UXers, we need to realize that qualitative data is our first love, and it should be. It's tied into user-centered design. And quantitative can help generalize those qualitative things, but should never be the, one, the only thing that we do. I have a quick question. Um, I mean, when you first started your talk, the first thing I thought of was um, the areas of, of sciences and psychology, who obviously also rely very much on research, and especially yeah. quantitative research. Did you look into the way that they're combating survey fatigue, and, or even how it's affecting their yeah. research? So in, in social research, this is a very um, heavily discussed theme. And especially, you know who's, who's been burdened the most by surveys in the COVID pandemic, doctors and nurses. Mm. So all of a sudden, all of the research went remote and over -rely reliance on surveys. And at the same time, those were exactly the people that we needed to learn from. Like all of the governmental institution, World Health Organization, they wanted to know how are those medical professionals feeling? Mm -hmm. And because everybody wanted to learn those things, everybody just blasted surveys to them and they stopped responding. Mm. It was a clusterfuck. We were mm. uh, at a blind spot. And then a lot of uh, studies came out by survey researchers researching survey surveys, and their their um, recommendations are basically the same mm. um, as the ones I put here. With one on top, which I cut out of my talk because it would have been too long. It's about how to sample, and the main message there is aim for high response rates in small samples, wh rather than sampling very big everyone and just hoping for the best. Mm -hmm. Because it's this oversampling and this sample size fetish that has gotten us to this problem as well. So in social research, it's a very heavily discussed team. In psychology, it goes back to psychometric theory. And that's actually where a lot of the issues came from. That theory says that if we have a construct, we need to ask it in as many different ways possible. And that's valid. Like when you want to measure someone's IQ or life satisfaction or personality, fine, ask me 375 questions. But if we are just a company, not in academics or government, and we just want to know, are you happy with how quickly we delivered your package? You don't need 10 questions. 
No, and we definitely don't want to be the problem. You know, um, I, I would say in the hierarchy, uh, scientific and academic research comes above mm -hmm. product-based research. So we don't want to be, you know, uh, unintended consequence of compromising those fields. So yeah. even more important for us to practice um, restraints when it comes to surveys. Absolutely. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. That was really fascinating. And, My uh, pleasure. Great. We're going to take a quick 15-minute break, and then we'll come back uh, and talk with Thorsten at 8 o'clock. So see you then.